Hi, I'm Kevin Cummings. At Investors Bank, we believe in helping our local neighborhoods and improving the lives of all we serve. We're a different bank that makes a difference for our employees, clients, and communities. That's why we're proud to support public television and the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank, Bloomfield College, offering small classes and big opportunities since 1868. PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. Qualcare Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents. Johnson & Johnson, choose New Jersey. Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. And by Verizon Communications. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. You see, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. This is a show called One on One. But today, it's One on Two. We are pleased to be uh, joined by Justina Hrigowska, who is uh, Communications Manager at Rising Tide Capital and Omar Ruffin, President and CEO of Biardi Biker Gear Corporation and the winner of Start Something Challenge. How are you doing, both of you? Doing great. great. This is a fascinating segment with a lot going on here. First of all, set up what is Rising Tide Capital. So Rising Tide Capital is a 501c3 organization. We're headquartered in a Jersey. A nonprofit. A nonprofit. 501c3 uh, nonprofit organization headquartered in Jersey City, New Jersey. And our mission is to assist entrepreneurs who are struggling and under-resourced to start and grow small businesses that then transform their lives and communities. Trying to help young and not so young entrepreneurs get their thing going. That's right. So is that why this guy is here? That's, that's exactly why he's here. Start something. So he went start something. What, what, did, he, what did you start? Well, well, I basically started a company, or I, well, I actually restarted a company that was started by my cousin. It's called the Biardi Biker Gear Corporation. And what it is, is it's a, um, so it's a company that focuses on protecting the motorcycle riders. Our premium product is called the Biker Sock, which we have here. The Biker Sock. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Describe it. The Biker Sock, as you can see here, it's a protective covering for your... Um, for your boots. Let me check okay, this out. Okay, sure. You can. Do I, can let, me, you know, let me ask you. Because I love things that protect bikers. I look like a biker, right? You do look like a biker, <laughs> Steve. Well, you would be wrong, sir. Um, <laughs> how's this, Bob? You got this? Describe, as I'm holding it up, describe it. I'm going to turn it slowly. Okay. So the Biardi Biker Sock is a shoe protector that guards against scuffs and abrasions on, your, on, on a rider's left shoe. It's basically made out of, as you can see, premium leather. The black portion that you're holding actually comes into contact with the, the actual. black portion right here? Yes. That's right. actually, uh, no, the uh, portion that you were just touching a moment ago. Uh, yes, yes, that portion. Yes, it actually comes into contact with the gear shift. And on really? most, yes, and on most times, most of the times, most um, shoes are basically uh, scuffed right in that area. And so basically what this does is it actually protects your shoe. So if you, so you say you have a $200 shoe, this is a $29.99 um, priced pro um, um, product, and it basically guards against all of that. And so you're able to guard against and, and, and also protect your investment, which is the shoe. That's wild. And, and by the way, is that online right now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can always find us at Biardi.net. They come in different colors? Yes. There Let's are see seven. the yellow one right there. Yes, yes. There are seven colors. This is actually a customized one that we brought as well. Um, but most of them come with the uh, uh, black shoe box right here. And also it comes in seven colors. And because it's going to be October, we have actually expanded into one new color, which is pink. And we're going to be donating proceeds to the Breast Cancer Research Foundation as That's well. That's beautiful. Yes. And is, is that the idea to help people establish their business and, and draw attention to it? Because online, is online sales the key? Well, uh, online is definitely an important part of it. Uh, you know, we work with a lot of entrepreneurs like Omar, who's gone through one of our programs called the Community Business Academy. So he really got the those. Community Business Academy. Yes. What do you he, do with that? 
So it's a 12-week course where Omar learned a lot of different business fundamentals like bookkeeping, cash flow, marketing. Um, and then he went on to take advantage of some of our support services for the graduates of the Community Business Academy. And that's how he came across the Start Something Challenge, which is a great opportunity for any New Jersey entrepreneur to learn some marketing skills, both online and offline. Hold on, back up. Am I right? Now, see, I've done too many shows because if I get this wrong, I'm going to be embarrassed on the air. Who's your CEO? Our CEO is Alpha Demolash, who is a, I love her. a guest on your show. <laughs> I yes. love her. She's the best. <laughs> Absolutely. She was here. A few she years back. She killed it when she was here. She was a, she's a superstar. Absolutely. Tell we, everyone who she is and why she's so special. And her story about her mom, right. who was making dresses, I think, right. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, absolutely. Real quick, tell me that story. So Alpha's mom uh, was a refugee from Ethiopia. She came to the United States with the hopes of bringing her daughter along. And she worked not only uh, you know, at a diner during the day, but at night she was making dresses so that in the hopes of bringing Alpha here, which she eventually did. Yeah. Um, and Alpha has been a success from, from the very start. I mean, she went to Harvard. She met her co-founder. They founded this wonderful organization who has helped over 1,000 entrepreneurs get started. and. It's just a tremendous story, success story that we're all very inspired about. Now I'm remembering how great she is, and it's making the connection with you guys. By the way, we're about to look at a, uh, a spot, a 30-second spot. It talks about your? Yes. So hold on. This is a spot that promotes your stuff. We'd like to introduce you to the Biardi Biker Sock and this 30-minute second tease. It better not be 30 minutes. We're going to 30 seconds. 30 second tease. And for more information, you can always go to Biardi.net. Thank you. Well done. Let's take a look. Whoa, 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 whoa. Who is, first of all, this is terrific. Who produced this? I did. <laughs> what, what, yes. what, what do you mean you did? So there's a program called Animoto, which is an awesome program uh, that Rising Tide Capital um, basically partners, partners us up with. Mm -hmm. And you basically go online and you kind of put together your video. So I used uh, pictures in order to, you know, paint a, paint a story or tell a story. How exciting is it to see that? That's exactly what it's all about, is learning new tools that our entrepreneurs can use to promote their business. And Animoto is just another video tool that everyone is afraid of, but once they kind of get, you know, a little, a little taste, they realize how easy it is, and it's a great promotional tool. And he wins the 10 grand in the challenge, right? Yeah, absolutely. So that's the carrot, right, at the end of the, <laughs> <laughs> at the, at the end carrot. of the road. And you had to do a live pitch. Had to do a live pitch, yes, sir. What was that like? A little nerve-wracking? Uh, just a little nerve-wracking, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, it, it, was, it was a lot of pressure. It was definitely a lot of pressure. But it, but it was great. It was the, actually the second time that I'd ever asked to actually pitch it in front of people. Like so. Shark Tank? It, it was a little like Shark Tank, but, uh, but there was no, um, uh, how do you say, there was uh, no millions of dollars at the end. Uh, but the 10,000, definitely. Big. Oh, that's a huge number. What do you wind up doing number. with that? Uh, well, we're definitely expanding the product, also working on uh, marketing, as well as introducing the pink color, um, which I think is going to be one, like, it, it's definitely going to be, like, a strong part of our um, going forward. All right, so, so you're an entrepreneur. Yeah. You're in the business. You're building your brand. And so I'm a student of leadership, and I ask you, all right, What's the number one lesson you've learned about leadership so far? What is it? Believe in yourself. That's probably it. Uh, the one thing that I can say is there has been a lot of people who was like, well, you know, well, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. What are you crazy? Are you nuts? This isn't going to work. You know, I, you know, I worked in corporate for 13 years. And recently I left corporate. And I'm a flight attendant during the day. You know, and so I make people laugh on the plane and I serve Cokes. That's what I do for a living, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and every day, I mean, people are so much more appreciative than at least I feel like, you know, when I was at the law firm. But the reason why I was at the law firm is because you make money at law firms. But when you actually step out on faith, it's, it's all on you. And if mm -hmm. you don't believe in yourself, then no one else will. Number one leadership lesson. And well, how about this? Number one leadership challenge. Oh, that's a really great question. Yeah. Um, I think it's just, again, believing in yourself. I think sometimes... Is, is it, I'm going to flip it. 
Yeah. If, if believing in yourself is the number one leadership lesson, does it wind up being, is the challenge, the difficulty believing in yourself when you have so many doubters and slash haters out there telling you it's not gonna happen. Absolutely, but that's why we're here. We're here you know, every step of the way so that whenever Omar needs something, you know, we can help him out because his success is our biggest success. It's hard to believe in yourself and other people. What are you doing? Why don't you just get a regular job? <laughs> Why don't you just get a regular job and stop this? And when you say, because you know what? It, it's very interesting. I was on the plane with a guy yesterday, as a matter of fact, and um, this guy, he started a telephone company. He started a telephone company in Salt Lake City, Utah. And he basically said everyone that he knew told him that he couldn't do it. And then he pulled out his phone and showed me two of his three houses. And he said, you know what? This, he, he said, what I'm doing here right now is I'm going to house hunt for a third house. And I have one son and I'm there unmarried. It is. You have to believe in yourself. I think that's the key. I, I, I hear you. And uh, those of us in public broadcasting, are crazy enough to believe in ourselves and public broadcasting and getting other people to buy in. That's the hard part, right? Absolutely. Investing Absolutely. or sponsors or underwriters, whatever you call them, is getting people to buy in. Absolutely. Uh, you and your organization and, and, and your leader, who is a great woman and a great entrepreneur, are making a difference in the lives of others. And you, uh, when you come back in a few years and making more money, you know we're just going to wind up hitting you up for money for public <laughs> television anyway. <laughs> I wish you nothing but the best. Absolutely. Thank you. You're a great guest, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And now you want me to, I, now I think, if I actually take up, you think they'll be good for me? Yeah, absolutely. I'm we can, uh, yeah, I'm just joking. <laughs> I would look terrible in this suit. No, you It's a joke. No, you wouldn't. I'll be right back right after this. I would look ridiculous. <laughs> Visit us online at steveautobato.org. Email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined by our friend, Dr. James Wittick, who is Chief of Orthopedic Oncology at Hackensack University Medical Center. Good to see you, Doctor. Hi, Steve. You were telling me right before we got on the air, um, we're talking about uh, amputation and the incredible changes, the improvements that have been made. You said that compared to, say, the mid, late 1970s, maybe early 80s, compared to today, Give me the statistic you gave me as it relates to saving limbs. So nowadays, compared to 20, 30 years ago, we can save about 95% of limbs or legs and arms. Um, whereas 20, 30 years ago, before, uh, before chemotherapy was really invented and uh, different limb sparing techniques were, were uh, really optimized. Uh, almost everybody underwent an amputation, and it's just been a dramatic change over the last 20 to 30 years. So, if someone has cancer it, in the bone, is that where it really? Yeah, in the okay. bone or in the soft tissues around the bone. Okay. So, so I actually said to you because this is you know the way I look at things. If you're un if you're unfortunate, if if it's going to happen, and you're unfortunate enough to have it, your odds are better today than 20, 30 years ago. Oh, dramatically better. Really? You know, you can uh, not only uh, save many more lives nowadays with uh, different chemotherapy regimens that were not available 20, 30 years ago, but you can also uh, dramatically improve the quality of their lives as they, as they live by saving their limbs and saving their arms and legs. Um, what's interesting to me is that, you know, the, the psychology of, of all this. You know, you say that it's very important that you shrink the tumor before the surgery. And I wasn't understanding that. You say, well, whatever the surgery is, like you shrink the tumor. I was like, well, why? Why would you do that? Why would you just go in and do what you have to do? Explain that to us. Well, many of the tumors that occur in the, in the legs or in the arms are, are pushed up against the blood vessels and the nerves. And uh, that often makes it difficult to save a leg or save an arm without, without shrinking it a little bit. So by giving a person, a uh, patient, preoperative chemotherapy or radiation, you actually kill the tumor. Uh, the body reacts against it, starts to heal once, that, once those cancer cells are dead and uh, shrinks it, which makes it much easier to save the soft tissue of the, of the leg or the arm and save the blood vessels and nerves, which are important for saving the extremity. When you got into this field, right? How many years ago was it? About 15 years ago. Just in those 15 years, what would you say the biggest improvement, advancement you've seen is? 
Well, I think the biggest advancements has really been in prosthetic reconstruction. Prosthetic reconstruction. Yeah, meaning um, different types of uh, bone and joint implants that are utilized to save the extremities. So you might think of a prosthetic uh, replacement as a total knee or a total hip replacement. That's what I thought you meant. Arthritis. That's but not what you mean? No, these are special types of replacements used for cancer patients who need very big segments of their bone and their joint removed in order to save, save the limb uh, that has a cancer in it. So you might have a cancer of the lower part of the femur, the thigh bone, and it's grown, it's replaced a lot of the thigh bone, and you have to take out that thigh bone and also the joint and then reconstruct it in some way. And there's been various different types of prostheses that have been developed over the last 15 years and improved upon as time has gone on. That what does that mean, improved upon? So explain to what was versus what is. Well, initially many of the prostheses were cemented into the bone and now we have different coatings that we could put on the prostheses that actually allow the bone to incorporate into the prosthetic replacement and the prosthetic replacement sort of become one with the bone. There's more durable metals, more durable uh, plastic components of the prostheses that make them last longer and different designs mm -hmm. of them because over the course of time a prosthetic replacement can loosen uh, sort of like um, sort of like a cat, uh, uh, filling in a tooth. It can, it can loosen, loosen over the course, course of time, yeah. And these are special techniques that were developed and the prostheses adjusted to minimize those loosening rates. So you talk a lot about rehab time. being important after surgery. Talk about that. So you can do a fantastic surgery and have get the cancer out, save their limb, but you have to make the extremity work afterward. And you've done a lot of manipulation of the muscles and the bone and the joint during the surgery. So after the surgery, it's very important that you have a very structured rehabilitation or physical therapy program for patients to rebuild their muscles, regain their function, and, uh, and get on with a good quality of life. Thinking about a patient <clears throat> doctor who has a recurring situation. They, they've got a recurrence of the cancer. And I know every case is different. So we, and when we, we do medical, uh, clinical uh, related subjects, we really watch ourselves generalizing, you know, because it's dangerous. But within those parameters, if you have a recurrence of the cancer, do you treat it very differently as it relates to the issues you're talking about? Uh, it can, it it depends on many different factors. It depends on the size of the recurrence, its location. Um, in most instances with a single recurrence, if it's caught sort of in the nick of time, uh, you can remove it again and observe the area again and perhaps consider more radiation or more chemotherapy at that point in time. Uh, when something becomes multiply recurrent, often there's really no option other than doing an amputation. And finally, on the amputation issue, the emotional and psychological pieces connected to that are very real. Certainly. And, and that people need help in that area and you provide that. Certainly. Yeah, we have uh, different support groups and patients that we, we put in contact with. Many of our, our patients who require amputations, patients who've had very good outcomes with, with uh, very massive amputations and have, are leading a normal life also. And they're very encouraging and help uh, newer patients through the, through the psychological process. But try to avoid that at all costs, though, as we said. Yeah, I mean, unless it's absolutely necessary. And uh, you said, in how many years, finally, doctor, do you think that it, we may be able to eliminate, eliminate, not all, but close to all? Well, right now there's a big focus on identifying different pathways of the way tumors develop and cancers develop and I'd say probably in the next decade we're going to have various different types of pills that a patient can take and we'll just turn off the cancer, shut it down and, and uh, make it disappear instead of requiring chemotherapy or requiring a major surgery. We can only hope you're right, Dr. James Whittick, mm -hmm. who is the Chief of Orthopedic Oncology at Hackensack University Medical Center. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Stay right there. We'll be right back mm -hmm. right after this. Visit us online at steveautobato.org. Email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD And follow us on Twitter at steveautobato. Deborah Lee Gao Schatz is president of the National Council of Jewish Women, Essex County Section. Good to have you with us. Thank you. You know, um, our friends at the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey told us about you and your organization, and the fact that you have something called 
the Back to School store. What is it and why is it so significant? You're helping a lot of people. We do. It's an amazing, amazing event. And our friends at Healthcare Foundation are part of it um, or have been part of it in the past. It is a program whereby we effectively create, build, and, and fill a pop-up department store mm. every summer. Where? Um, in West Orange. We hold it at B'nai Shalom. It's a local synagogue. Sure. Um, and we bring in children, over 600 of them, in one single day. Where are they from? They're from all over the county. Um, they come through social service agencies mm -hmm. who we work directly with. They, in turn, identify the children who would qualify for the store. It's all kids going into grades K through 5, um, all underserved who really could use the goods that we're going to be able to give them. And they literally come in and shop at the store with a personal shopper. They walk through, they pick out all new clothes for school, a backpack, uh, school supplies, personal care items, and they have a heck of a good time doing it. So these kids, and by the way, um, Jackie, we're going to show some pictures. We're going to show some pictures as you're talking about it. These kids, first day of school, would otherwise have what if this, uh, they're showing pictures as we speak, what would they have otherwise? Well, you know what? In every case, it's different, but many, many of the children tell us they've never had new clothes. Um, some of them have never had a backpack to take to school. Never a backpack? No, some of them don't. Um, and these kids all get, that's the first thing they pick up when they start their day. They pick out a backpack of their choosing, and we have hundreds of them in where all the different Where do they come from? Where does this stuff come well, from? Well, we purchase or negotiate for purchase or get in-kind donations from sponsors, funders, grantors. We raise a tremendous amount of money to do this. And then we work with local retailers, local wholesalers, and some of our sponsors and funders offer us goods in kind. Are people generous? People are amazingly Why? generous. Because they see what a difference it makes in the lives of children. We, when these personal shoppers work one-on-one -on -one with the, the kids. Who are the personal shoppers? What's volunteers, just like you and me. So they, they go in with these kids? They take them one-on-one. -on -one. Well, what we were have, the parents? The parents go into a family resource center where we have health screenings, social service information, all kinds of things for them. This is just the child and the adult. So the parent is getting important information right. for the child and the family. Right beyond this mm -hmm. and go back to the, the, sh the personal shopper and the kid. Go ahead. Right. So the shopper and the child form a little bond for about 45 minutes and they go into the store and they select the backpack and they go in and it literally looks like a department store. There are racks and racks of clothing and the child walks over and says, I like that one. And some of them have never had the opportunity to do this. But the real thing that got us was the first year a, a child said to us when they were picking out health uh, health care and personal care items, sure. they picked out a toothbrush and they said, is this just for me? I've never had my own. And, you know, it just gets our hearts going and we, we just want to do as much as we can because the parents are so appreciative, the social service agencies can't thank us enough. And the bottom line is the volunteers feel so great about doing it. Where did this come from? Well, one of our sections, an NCJW section in St. Louis, was doing it. Uh, so about eight years ago, I went out to St. Louis with two of my co-chair volunteers, and we saw their store and saw what they were doing and took copious notes and came back and found a site and adapted it for Essex County. And off we went. We had 250 kids that first year. Now we had, this past August, we had over 620 in one day. What's it do for you? Oh, it makes me... It's, I do all the training of the personal shoppers that day. They all go through a little half hour training before they get their children. And as I always start my trainings, it's the best day of the year. It is the most rewarding thing I do in my life. And I've been doing volunteer work for well over 20 years with NTGW, with other organizations. It's just incredibly satisfying. What happens? I mean, you've gone from a couple hundred kids to now 600 and... 20 plus. What happens? I mean, obviously the need is great, the demand mm -hmm. is great. What happens as the need and the demand keeps getting greater? You can't grow. Well, we can't outgrow our space right now, right. Um, but we can do things. We are talking about things like um, going out to agencies, to shelters, to other places and delivering goods to them. We can really? only take so many children sure. through the store in a day. Um, right now, we haven't quite topped out on that. We shop for enough clothes for well over 800 children because we want everyone to have choice.
So wow. we store goods all year long ready for next year. What, so, what do you hear from, I'm sorry for interrupting, what do you ahead. hear from the parents? Well, the parents are often standing there thanking us, hugging us. Um, they're so appreciative. And some of them return the next year, and some of them have more, more than one child coming through the store. Yeah. And they make it very clear that we are serving a need, we're filling a gap in their lives, and they, they can't always do what they would like to do for their children. And this just gets everybody feeling mm. so good as they head into the school year. What does it do for the schools? Well, we work with schools in a lot of ways. This obviously gives any school where these children attend a leg up because they come with some goods that they wouldn't have otherwise. We also have programs where we're working in schools. We have four schools. We run kids' emergency closets mm -hmm. where in case they need some clothing at the last minute or the child has shown up on 10 degree, 20 degree days without a winter coat, we have closets in those schools for emergencies that teachers have access to and they can fill in where those children clearly need. You know, um, I've asked people this leadership question, CEOs, presidents of universities, um, educators, heads of nonprofits, but it's interesting, someone who is involved in volunteer work mm -hmm. and doing the work you do, you may be one of the best people I could ever uh -oh. ask this, and so the question is this, what is the greatest lesson you learned about leadership? Um, well, I would probably say it's twinned. Um, part of it would have to be that you need to be efficient with your time and you have to delegate well. Can't you, when someone says, just do it yourself. It's the only way you know it's going to get done. You I say. like to do things myself, <laughs> but I have found out that it doesn't work that way. You can't do it. It's too big an organization. There's too many, too many things that need to get done and they will get done better if you can use different people to use their best skills to complement your best skills, because nobody has all the skills to do it all well. That's something I've And how about learned. getting those great people? Well, at NCJW, we're incredibly fortunate. We have 3,200 members in Essex County, and probably several hundred who are incredibly active. I have a 63-person board, 15 wow. of whom are past presidents. So they are there with all their expertise every day to help. and And a staff of 13 who are amazing. It's called the Back to school store and it is an incredible, incredible initiative in making a difference in the lives of so many. I want to thank you for joining us, Deborah. Keep doing what you're doing. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank, Bloomfield College, PSE&G, Qualcare Inc., Johnson & Johnson, Choose New Jersey, and by Verizon Communications. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, Small News, Big News, True Jersey, and by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.